As we discussed last time, the Manson family was a murderous cult operating in Southern California during the 1960s and 1970s and beyond. 1960s, in the midst of the Vietnam War, was both a time of anger against the conflict and hope for a new world of peace by many young adults in America. In 1969, Tex Watson became involved in drug dealing and robbed a 22-year-old drug dealer named Bernard Latsapapa Crow. Crow allegedly responded with threatening to kill everybody living on the ranch. In response to this, Manson shot Crow on July 1st, 1969, at Manson's Hollywood apartment. Some newspaper outlets reported that the body of a Black Panther had, had later been dumped. And though there is no proof that Crow was a member of the Black Panthers, Manson concluded that he had been and expected retaliation from the Panthers. He returned to Spahn Ranch in defensive mode, getting ready for the race war. Tex Watson were later right, Blackie is trying to get the Chosen One, meaning Manson, who brought in members of the Straight Satan's Motorcycle Club as added security to the ranch. During the summer of 1969, an individual by the name of Gary Hinman became a follower of Buddhism and even began planning a pilgrimage to Japan to confirm his new faith. Hinman had previously befriended members of the Manson family, including Bobby Busilo. Several of them, including Bobby, even lived at Hinman's Topanga Canyon home in the greater L.A. area during the summer of 69, while Charles Manson was establishing his compound at the Span Ranch. Twelve years later, after his incarceration for Hinman's murder, Bosalal stated that he had purchased 1,000 hits of mescaline, a psychedelic drug, from Hinman, and that he later sold those to customers who were not satisfied and wanted their money back. Bosalal then went back to Hinman and asked for his $1,000 back since the dope was bunk. It should be noted that no reference of a drug deal was made on either of Bosilo's two murder trials. Manson was under the impression that Gary Hinman was sitting on a pile of a lot of inherited money, at least $20,000, which would be closer to $100,000 today. So on July 25, 1969, Manson ordered Bosilo to go over to Hinman's house with the intentions of scaring him out of the $1,000 and to collect even more. Bobby Bosilel was accompanied by two Manson girls, Susan Atkins and Mary Bruner, who had been rumored to have had sex with Gary Hinman when he visited Span Ranch, and so they were brought along as extra manipulators. The next day, Charles Manson himself arrived at Gary Hinman's residence, along with family member Bruce Davis and Bobby Bosilo. After Bobby told Charlie that, regrettably, they would not be able to get their money back, Manson produced a Japanese samurai sword that he had brought along and sliced Hinman's ear and cheek. Manson and Davis took off in one of Hinman's cars and left a panicked Bobby Bobby Bosilo and the girls behind with the injured Gary Hinman. Allegedly, on Charles Manson's orders, Gary Hinman was tortured for several days to get him to tell the Manson family where all the money was, since Charlie didn't believe he was broke. After several phone calls with Charles Manson and agonizing over what to do with Gary Hinman, who would surely talk to the police about the extortion scheme, he decided that the only thing he could do was to kill him. After he was done doing so, Bobby wrote political piggy and human's blood across his wall. And he also drew a paw print on the wall in an attempt to use a logo that was well known for being used by the Black Panthers. And to help instigate the race war that Charles Manson had preached was coming soon. Bobby was arrested on August 6, 1969, after he was caught driving Hinman's car. And police found the murder weapon in the trunk of the vehicle inside the tire well. But the murderous rampage was about to get worse. As depicted in the fictional 2019 movie, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, directed by Quentin Tarantino, there were some real historical characters played in that movie, although the actual events were changed, I think due to the way that Tarantino wished it had gone down. On March 23, 1969, Manson, while being uninvited, entered the grounds of 10050 Cielo Drive, located in Beverly Hills above L.A., which he had previously known as being Terry Melcher's residence the one who turned him down for a reporting contract. So his initial target may have been one of revenge. At the time, Melcher was going out with actress Candace Bergen, but the home was now rented and occupied by actress Sharon Tate 
and film director Roman Polanski. Tate had appeared in the 1967 movie Valley of the Dolls, as well as The Wrecking Crew in 1968, and had just filmed her last movie, The Thirteen Chairs, shot in Italy by Polanski in 1969. Polanski's movie credits include the 1968 classic horror film Rosemary's Baby and The Fearless Vampire Killers, whereby he first met Tate in 1967. Polanski had been gone in Europe. As he approached the main house, Manson was met by Sharak Hatami, an Iranian photographer who had befriended Polanski. Hatami had gone onto the front porch to ask Manson what he wanted. Manson said that he was there looking for someone. Hatami informed him that the place was now the Polanski residence. But if you wanted more information, try the back guest house, using the back alley to get to it. Sharon Tate appeared behind Hatami when he was questioning Manson. Hatami and Tate then maintained their positions while Manson went back to the guest house and then returned a minute or two later and left. That evening, Manson returned to the property again and went to the guest house. He entered the enclosed porch and spoke with Rudolf Altobelli, the property owner who had just come out of the shower. Altobelli told Manson that he was leaving the country the next day, and Manson said he'd like to speak to him upon his return. But Altobelli said he'd be gone for more than a year and asked Manson not to disturb the tenants, Sharon Tate and her husband, Roman Polanski. It is interesting to me that Sebring and Tate attended a 1968 New Year's Eve party at Mama Cass's house, which Charles Manson is also said to have attended. Back in the early 1960s, J. Sebring and others were part of the hairstyling revolution as they cut both women's and men's hair, combining the techniques of both profession and inventing new ones. Hollywood stars first took on the new look and then it spread to the general public. Just as a side note, my father was one of the best-known hairstylists in Seattle during the 1960s and 70s, winning numerous hair show awards, and whom I often modeled for at these shows. My pops studied under J. Sebring at his L.A. seminars, as well as studying under English hairstylist Vidal Sassoon and others, and then went on to conduct his own hairstyling workshops, even selling his own shampoos and hair products. This was before Gene Juarez later became big with his hairstyling chain in the Seattle area. Just ask anybody who was anybody in Seattle at the time. You can find out more information in my autobio, Life and Times of About the Local. Abigail Folger was heir to the Folger's Coffee Company portion. She and her boyfriend, Rochsiak Rykowski, were Tate's friends, and they came over to the house that night. Manson family members Tex Watson drove Susan Atkins, Linda Casavian, and Patricia Krenwinkel from the Spahn Ranch to the Seattle Drive residence, the home of Sharon Tate and Roman Polanski. Watson later claimed that Manson directed him to go to the house and destroy everyone in it and do it as gruesome as you can. He states that Manson told the women to do as Watson instructed them. Watson arrived with the three women just past midnight on August 9, 1969. Watson climbed a telephone pole near the gate's entrance and cut the phone line in the house. They climbed up a bushy embankment to the right of the gate and entered the grounds. Headlights approached them from within the property, and Watson ordered the women to lie in the bushes. Still a teenager, Stephen Parent was the first to be killed. He saw Sharon Tate's guest and caretaker, William Gerritsen, hitchhiking on the road. So Steve gave him a ride to the Tate residence and visited with him for a little while in the guest house out back where Gerritsen was staying. The investigation found that Steve Parent stayed with Gerritsen about 45 minutes and then decided to call it a night. After his friend Steve Parent left, William Gerritsen started listening to music. Just after midnight, he heard some noises, but was not sure if it was Antebelli's dogs outside or neighbors close by having a little party. And as he was getting for bed, he turned off the lights and put headphones on. That probably saved his life. As he was driving away from the guest house, Stephen Parent stopped at the gate to press the button to allow him to get out. But he was approached in the dark by a menacing figure who screamed, Halt! This was Manson family member Tex Watson. And he approached Stephen with a long-barreled twenty-two revolver in one hand and a buck knife in the other. Parent told Watson, please don't hurt me. I won't say anything. But Watson advanced aggressively, and Parent put up his hands in defense. Watson then gave him a slash wound across his palm that severed the tendons. And Watson's buck knife even cut off the wristwatch that Parent was wearing. Watson then shot Stephen Parent four times as he lay dying in the driver's seat. 
Watson then ordered the woman to help him push the car out of the way. Watson next cut the screen of the window and then told Kasabian to keep watch down by the gate. And she stayed by Parrot's car with the body now in it and waited as told. After he entered through the window, Watkins then let Atkins and Krenwinkel in through the front door. He whispered to Atkins and they awoke Frykowski, who was asleep on the living room couch. Watson kicked him in the head and Frykowski, being startled, asked him what was he doing there. Watson replied, I'm the devil, and I'm here to do the devil's business. On Watkins' direction, Atkins on the house's other three occupants, with Krenwinkel's help, and forced them into the living room. Watkins began to tie Tate and Sebring together by their necks with a long nylon rope, then slung it over one of the living room ceiling's beams. Sebring protested their rough treatment of the pregnant Tate, so Watson shot him. Abigail Folger was momentarily taken to a back bedroom for her purse, and she gave the soon-to-be murderers $70. Watson then stabbed Jay Sebring seven times. Frykowski's hands had been bound with a towel, but he freed himself and began struggling with Atkins, who stabbed at his legs with a knife. He then fought his way out to the front door and onto the porch, but Watson caught up with him, struck him over the head with a gun multiple times, and stabbed him repeatedly, then shot him twice. Inside the house, Abigail Folger had escaped from Krenwinkel and fled out a bedroom door to the pool area. Krenwinkel then gave chase and caught her on the front lawn, where she stabbed her and tackled her to the ground. Watson also helped restrain Folger, and they stabbed her a total of 28 times. In the house, Sharon Tate pleaded with the assailants to let her and her unborn child live. But Atkins and Watson ignored her and stabbed her 16 times, killing her and her unborn child. According to Watson, Charles Manson had ordered they leave a sign to make it look witchy. So Atkins wrote pig on the front door in Tate's blood. Atkins claimed she did this to make it appear this was a copycat murder of the Gary Hinman murder in order to get Manson family member Bobby Bosalel out of jail since he was in custody for the Hinman murder. If you recall earlier, Bosalel had wrote political piggy in Hinman's blood after stabbing him to death. Although initially questioned by police the next day, and considered to possibly be a suspect in the gruesome murders. Gerritsen was exonerated when police determined that a double homicide that occurred the following night was done by the same killers. The following night, those four people, in addition to Manson, Leslie Van Houten, and Steve Clem Grogan, committed two more murders. Manson allegedly said he was going to show them how to do it, or how it's done. They considered various options. Kasabian was the driver, and she drove the group to 3301 Waverly Drive in the Los Feliz neighborhood of L.A. It was a 1920s gated, single-story home with a pool. The home belonged to supermarket executive Lino LaBianca and his wife Rosemary, who was co-owner of a dress shop. Watson, Krenwinkel, and Van Houten entered the home and killed the couple in the early morning hours of August 10th. Watson claims Manson roused the sleeping Lino LaBianca from the couch at gunpoint, and Watson bound his hands with a leather strap. Rosemary was brought into the living room from her bedroom, and Watson covered their heads with pillowcases, which she bound in place with lamp cords. Manson then left, and Krenwinkel and Van Houten entered the house. Watson sent the women from the kitchen to the bedroom whereby Rosemary LaBianca had been returned, while he went into the living room and began stabbing Lino with a chrome-plated bayonet. The first thrust went to his throat. Watson later stated they heard a scuffle in the bedroom and went there to discover Rosemary LaBianca trying to keep the women at bay by swinging the lamp that was tied to her neck. He then stabbed her several times with the bayonet and resumed to continue stabbing Lino a dozen more times. He then carved war into his abdomen. After he's done, Watson returned to the bedroom where he found Krenwinkel finishing off Rosemary with a knife from the kitchen. While she was doing this, Van Houten stabbed her 16 times in the back and buttocks. In total, it was found at the autopsy that Rosemary had 41 stab wounds on her body, many of them inflicted post-mortem, meaning that she was already dead. Watson then cleaned off the bayonet and being covered in blood, he showered, while Krenwinkel wrote, Rise and Death to Pigs on the walls, and misspelt Helter Skelter on the refrigerator door, all done in the LaBianca's blood. Finally, she gave Lino LaBianca 14 more puncture wounds with the ivory handle two-tin carving fork, which she left jutting out of his stomach. She also planted a large steak knife in his throat. 
35-year-old Hollywood stuntman Donald Jerome Shorty Shea was murdered on August 26, 1969, more than two weeks after the Tate LaBianca murders. When Manson told Shea, Bruce Davis, Tex Watson, and Steve Grogan to go on a little ride, according to Davis, he sat in the back seat with Grogan, who then hit Shea in the head with a pipe wrench, and Tex Watson then stabbed him. After done killing him, they brought Shia down a hillside behind a ranch and stabbed him and brutally tortured him to death. They believed Shia had reported the family to police. His remains were not found until December 1977 when Grogan agreed to lead investigators to the spot where Shia had been buried. That concludes part two, True Crime Profiles, Charles Manson and the Manson Family. Part three will resume shortly. For now, this is Gabe Morales signing off. Gangsters, cops, and politicians.